Well, I want to begin by thanking uh, Bob Kiter, uh, Lincoln Davies, uh, Amy, especially Jan Nystrom, uh, Elizabeth, all the folks here at the Stegner Center who uh, once again have just put on an amazing conference. So uh, all our presenters as well, they were compelling, engaging, knowledgeable, and articulate. And uh, I have to confess that as I sat where you are and tried to take notes and keep up, capture it all, I felt a little like a, a dog chasing cars on the interstate. Um, my presentation today is going to be a little different. I'm not going to use this screen. I think I'm the only presenter uh, who doesn't have a PowerPoint. I had an op-ed in the uh, LA Times last week uh, questioning whether spending $54 billion on new nuclear power plants was the smartest thing we could do with that money. And uh, on the web section of the LA Times, uh, I was referred to by one commentator as uh, a boneheaded Luddite. I'm thinking of putting that on my card. Anyway, since I don't have PowerPoint, I guess you could consider this the boneheaded Luddite portion of the program. Uh, I would like to also say that at the end, I know I can't imagine any of you are hungry the way they have been feeding us here, uh, but you may have places to go and we are running a little late. So instead of taking questions, I'm just going to step down there. If you want to talk to me, come on over. Otherwise, you can feel free to leave as soon as I'm done here. Uh, there's another way that this is going to be a little different. Uh, in a wrap-up, um, you usually tell folks things that they've already heard, which is okay. I mean, we're supposed to, I think at this point, concluding, uh, talk about what's important, what we value, what we know, what we can hope. Uh, but I also hope that this wrap-up is a little different in that it is a, you might say, a grassroots perspective on sustainability. I'm not an academic. I'm known as an organizer, an activist, occasional author. And uh, I can't say that I represent all citizens, but I can't claim that I'm anything but a citizen. If you want to get commitment, if you want to have the will to make the changes we're talking about, you really need buy-in from citizens. So I'm, I would like to try to capture that perspective. Shedding a way of life based on limitless growth, the celebration and reward of excess, and deeply ingrained habits of acquisition, consumption, and waste is going to be an overwhelming challenge. The culture of faster, bigger, more will not yield easily to a new orientation where sustainability is the rule. We're going to need all the expertise we can muster to understand how we have overloaded the Earth's carrying capacity and how we can tread from here on with a, light, a lighter footprint. Innovations in technology, policy, law, and practices are absolutely essential. We need new models. As the sort, as Bersita Taylor and other speakers here have pointed out, integrating our concern for the health of ecosystems and the vitality of the individuals and human communities that inhabit those ecosystems is crucial. As we move forward, we must learn not just to connect, but to weave. It is crucial that we change the goals and the rules that we live by through new laws, new policies, new programs, incentives, and constraints. At a deeper level, I believe that living within the boundaries of nature requires a profound shift in our perspective. We have to stop seeing nature as merely a limitless source of lifeless commodities to be used and traded, and start seeing the natural realm as an astounding web of living communities that includes us. And we have to see that we do not live above and beyond the dynamic of the Earth's operating systems that sustain life itself. After centuries of driving economies, we have to learn to dance with ecosystems. When you see your habitat as a collection of dead, disconnected things to be manipulated for power and profit, you try to steer and control nature. If you see yourself embedded in an ecosystem that is fluid, that has thresholds, and that is so thoroughly 
interconnected, self-organizing, and emergent, that it is not only more complex than we thought, but more complex than we can think, then you don't drive nature. You dance with her. Let me offer some dancing lessons. Our understandings of ecosystems tells us that biological diversity is key and can be translated into resilience when an ecosystem is disturbed or stressed. We would be wise to heed that in the cultural realm as well, where intellectual diversity and lots of open and inclusive feedback is also key. As someone who has organized campaigns to make polluters accountable, I can attest that the health and vitality of one's physical slash natural environment is often a direct expression of the health and vitality of one's civic environment. A robust democratic system then, like a vital ecosystem, requires a diverse mix of options to draw from when challenged with change. It needs credible feedback on how choices we make together are working so it can self-correct. Decisions about how to protect human health and how to conserve ecosystem vitality are more likely to be wise and precautionary when they are made openly, when they are inclusive, when they are informed, and when they are accountable. An active democratic culture then is a prerequisite for the kinds of changes we have been encouraging here. So it's not enough to consult ecologists and economists, even if you put them at the same table and make them talk to one another. Citizens must also be there. If you look to where sustainability, or hopeful transition to sustainability, is actually being attempted, you'll find citizens acting at the grassroots, neighbor to neighbor, rebuilding their communities, civic communities and environments while aiming to be sustainable. This is often happening under a different banner than sustainability per se. People talk about peak oil, for example, and the potential for crippling shortages and price hikes. They understand that nature is loaded with disturbances, earthquakes, hurricanes, firestorms, floods, droughts, and pandemics that could interrupt our far-flung food and energy supply lines. They don't believe the center can hold, and they want to be prepared for the inevitable surprises and disruptions. They also recognize that if our, life, if our way of life is unsustainable, the obvious implication of that is collapse. That at some time, a tipping point is crossed, and the system that cannot be sustained breaks down because it destroys the very conditions that allow it to persist. The very term, unsustainable, tells you the end of the story. And if you see yourself and your loved ones at the end of that story, then you would be wise and prudent to work to make the unsustainable system sustainable, or to build a lifeboat, or to do both. This movement towards what might be called de facto sustainability is answering the question, what can we do for ourselves that is sustainable when what is not sustainable goes away? This movement is happening without federal aid or direction. It is growing from the bottom up. It's a grassroots phenomenon because those whose wealth and power are entrenched in the unsustainable system are unlikely to challenge the very system that upholds their wealth and power or even give unsustainable short-term values like the next quarterly report and change it. I call it a movement, but it's less intentional and coherent than that. It's more like an emergence, and much of it is still in a rough draft phase. Because they assume they will live through turbulent times in a globally warming world that is running on empty, it's easy to mistake these folks for some new kind of survivalists. Not so. It isn't about building bunkers, it's about building community. In this emerging age of chaos, we are learning that our most reliable security is not in the hands of distant officials in Washington, but in the hands of neighbors, 
that self-reliance is more safe than dependence, that a robust community will be more effective in a crisis than thousands of individuals breaking out survival kits alone and waiting for helicopters to land or waiting for the gasoline tanker trucks to return. If what we must survive is the unraveling of an unsustainable system, then it makes sense to aim for a more honest and realistic reckoning of the Earth's carrying capacity and the human impact on that the next time around. It makes no sense to invent a post-collapse society or economy that is also unsustainable, that also ignores limits, contingencies, footprints, uncertainties. I urge you to use the term resilience when you make your case for sustainability. Living sustainably is ultimately a profoundly moral imperative that involves our obligations to future generations, to our children's children. That moral argument must be made, and hopefully it will take hold over the long run. In the meanwhile, we must motivate other people to change now. In my experience as an activist and organizer, people are more likely to change their immediate behaviors when it seems in their self-interest to do so, not because someone tells them they ought to do something or they should do something. Too often, when we use the term sustainability, other people we want to influence here eat your peas. Oh, and eat fewer of them. The word resilience makes sense and resonates positively. If disturbance is inevitable, and in this age of climate chaos and economic failure, disturbance is indeed inevitable, then it makes sense to protect oneself by having a plan and by belonging to a group that can offer mutual aid. As Bill McKibben points out in his insightful book, Deep Economy, in a world beset by unpredictable and extreme weather, shortages and disruptions, Comfort, security, and meaning will no longer be determined by ownership, but by membership, by being a participant in a community that can provide mutual aid in a turbulent time. In Great Britain, a transition towns movement has sprung up in an effort to spark ideas and focus energies on whole, how whole communities can get off of imported energy and food. Relocalization is an international movement developing a compelling platform for the greening of modern society. In Europe, there are now hundreds of local groups in at least a dozen countries that are convening community meetings to, quote, make other arrangements for the post-carbon future. With a rising sea at its door, the Netherlands has taken it a step further. Its national security plan actually makes sustainability and environmental recovery key priorities. In the US, post-carbon and transition working groups are beginning to spread up across the country, and often not under those banners. For example, there is a grassroots group right here in Salt Lake, many of you may be familiar with, Heal Utah, which has embarked on a campaign called E-Utah. They're bringing citizens, scientists, engineers, utility administrators, business leaders, and reps from state and local government together to envision and then detail a plan to provide Utah with 100% locally controlled alternative energy. No coal, no nuclear, period. Now, that may sound impossible, or at least impractical, but fundamental change begins with visions that are bold and inspiring, not mundane. Central to Heal's vision is also the recognition that small-scale technology is often cheaper and more resilient and does not undermine democratic institutions by requiring the centralization of capital, expertise, and authority. Such local groups are often loosely allied with one another through websites and blogs that report on the progress of diverse projects, trade ideas, trade information, and offer lots of feedback. Again, this is not a traditional movement. It is more emergent than ideolo ideological, more open source than doctrinaire. Although the citizens engaged in such projects have largely given up on outside aid, 
think of what could be accomplished if just a fraction of the billions of dollars we spend on foreign wars and Wall Street bailouts could go towards building resilient communities. We could be creating community gardens and farmers markets, promoting regional food security, encouraging those who want to homestead abandoned urban landscapes. We could build bike paths, retrofit homes and businesses with off-the-grid solar and wind, and we could do so much more to conserve local watersheds, restore habitat, and build connectivity. We could scalp a lot of water. Instead of homeland security, we could have homegrown security. When citizens cannot rely on big, distant, and inaccessible agencies, they find that within the context of their own communities, their actions make sense and resonate with meaning. It's a simple matter of scale. Most of us who are aware that change is needed are caught between the seeming futility of small-scale actions like recycling our trash, using different light bulbs, taking shorter showers, and the impotence we experience when we push for large-scale change, like climate legislation in Congress or an international treaty in Copenhagen. On the one hand, too little. On the other hand, too late. There is, however, a middle scale between individual actions and national or global campaigns that works well and makes sense, the community. At the community scale, people can embrace their roles as citizens, face one another, contend, cooperate, create and learn from one another, empower one another. Participation in a community requires commitment and commitment is an investment in precious time and energy. The rewards for that have to be real. The relationships created within one's own neighborhood or town can be powerful and compelling. Especially in hard economic times as these, one's personal network of friends and family, coworkers and neighbors can be all that we have to fall back on when a job disappears, a business fails, or a home is lost. If you believe, as I do, that our carbon-driven, industrial, overburdening way of life is unsustainable and is doomed to fail, one way or the other, sooner or later, then it is important to understand how that will play out. I don't see a global apocalyptic scenario on the order of popular treatments like uh, the movie 2012. Collapse will also be experienced locally. Hurricane Katrina, for example, is commonly seen as a harbinger of a world that is experiencing climate chaos. It was a watershed event in our emerging consciousness about the new turbulent climate regime to come, an atmospheric dynamic that, given enough reinforcing feedback, could knock down civilization itself. But most of us would scoff at the idea that Hurricane Car Katrina was indeed the big one the end of the world. But it was, in fact, the end of the world for the thousand people who drowned there. It wasn't the end of civilization for most of us either, but for those who lost homes and businesses, jobs, family and community, for those now homeless and living in refugee trailer parks, it might as well have been the end of civilization. The consequences of our unsustainable way of life will be experienced incrementally, individually, locally, variably, and unpredictably. Again, it makes sense to act where you are and to do so now. Build that crucial network for mutual aid before turbulence hits. Here in the West, we would be especially wise to learn from those who are trying to become resilient. We live in a landscape that separates cities by great distances. We are particularly vulnerable to disruptions in fuel supplies, so since so much of what we depend on is trucked and airlifted to us from far away. Like most American cities, Western cities have only a, about a week's worth of food in the pipeline at any given time. Isolated rural communities are even more vulnerable. 
our industrialized and globalized food production and distribution system is a wonder. It brings us exotic foods from distant places at affordable prices. Those mangoes from Mexico and the kiwis from New Zealand are wonderful, and I love eating vegetables from Chile in the winter. But food shipped from that far away can be disrupted many ways. A calamitous storm that hits a food growing center, spikes in the price of fuel for fertilizer, farm machinery, and trucking, regional warfare that shuts down harvests or blocks trade routes, national policies to hoard food as price hikes set in and scarcities happen, not to speak of the usual droughts and floods and crop failures that have always plagued humankind and are intensifying in a globally warmed world. Imagine what would happen if a global pandemic and the ensuing panic shut down ports and air traffic for even a month. Sadly, for those of us who live outside of California and Florida, local food remains seasonal, limited, and anything but diverse. In Torrey, where I live, if the gro grocery shelves were suddenly empty, if the trucks stopped rolling, I would eat a lot of cow. I mean a lot of cow. An interruption of food supplies from far away is only tolerable if we've planned ahead and can fill in with local, sustainable, resilient agriculture. Westerners also live in a dynamic landscape prone to disturbance. If Salt Lake goes down in an earthquake, FEMA can, we hope, feed people via trucks and airlifts. If some part of the global food trade were to shut down, however, hundreds of thousands of community gardens and networks of backyard farmers ready to share their harvests, not warehouses full of emergency provisions, could prove the difference between a crisis and a catastrophe. If homegrown agriculture sounds unrealistic, consider this. In 1943, barely two years into World War II, 20 million American victory gardens were producing a staggering 30 to 40% of the nation's vegetables. Thousands of abandoned urban lots were being cleared and planted by tenement workers, tenement neighbors working together. The Office of Civilian Defense encouraged and empowered such projects, but the phenomenon was also self-organizing because citizens on the home front wanted to participate. Home gardening, was a delicious way to be patriotic. Today, it could be an appealing invitation to resilience. I suspect that resilience is ultimately a matter of scale, distribution, modularity, and redundancy. Building resilient communities and economies will involve deeper challenges to prevailing assumptions and habits than just learning how to garden together but I believe that we have at least begun to shift away from a culture of reduction and fragmentation from centuries of understanding how the earth makes wealth to understanding how the earth creates health. It's a shift from mindless and blind growth for growth's sake to a recognition that ecosystem and watershed viability require reciprocal relationships and constraints and that such reciprocity and constraint imply stewardship, thrift, temperance, precaution, fairness, generosity, care, solidarity, and love, a word I have not heard here in the last two days. When I addressed this conference in 2005, I said that ultimately we save what we love that caring for a landscape to which we feel keenly connected is the very ground of our commitment to ecological citizenship. That is still the case. We need to experience the land firsthand, but we also need tools, even those of us who already care deeply. I wanna to suggest to you this afternoon that people who are working towards sustainability have tools, have concepts, that lead them on that people who resist change do not have. When I was working with rural people who lived downwind from chemical, west, chemical weapons testing and toxic waste incinerators, 
I couldn't enlist them in campaigns to make polluters accountable until they understood that the closest link between them and their environment was their own bloodstreams. That decisions about what we allow into our air, our water, and our soil get translated into flesh and, bud and bone and daily experience. That consciousness preceded commitment. Getting to people to live sustainably isn't going to happen because we shake our fingers and say, no, no, you are behaving foolishly or greedily or even self-destructively. That woman you see pushing the pallet out the door of Costco with a package of toilet paper the size of a parade float isn't, is going to hear that as pointy-headed criticism, and if, you know, she's going to use that toilet paper anyway, and what's her alternative? If you make her feel badly enough, she's going to go listen to Rush because he makes her feel good about herself. <laughs> she needs a new context for understanding her consumption, and above all, she needs to become ecologically literate. Ecological literacy is a key. The ecological sciences are the very basis for our environmental laws and policies. The emerging global movement to deal with climate chaos and restore the Earth's operating systems is premised on understandings gained through the environmental sciences. Ignorance of those sciences undermines the very basis for the changes we so urgently need. Ecological science, for example, shows us the value of biodiversity and the resilience of stressed ecosystems and the important role that keystone species play in keeping ecosystems vital. If you do not accept evolutionary theory, you are also likely to reject the need to protect biodiversity. Saving owls and restoring wolves may strike you as the crazy idea of extremists, elitists, you are also less likely to recognize when a natural system like the Earth's climate is getting pushed past the tipping point. To go back to that dance analogy, if you are ecologically illiterate, you can't get the beat and you don't know the moves. You can't do the dance if you can't see the dance floor. The fundamental contradiction of our time is this. We have built an all-encompassing economic engine that requires constant, unending growth. A contraction of even a percent or two is a crisis. But we are embedded in ecosystems that are indeed limited. There's only so much fertile soil, so much fresh water. There are only so many fish in the ocean. The atmosphere can only absorb so much carbon dioxide and remain benign. As Kenneth Boulding memorably remarked, Anyone who thinks that exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> but certainly not an ecologist. The bottom line of ecoliteracy is understanding the reality of those limits and the self-destructive impact of unrestrained growth. To say that we must learn to live within limits is not to say our lives will be diminished, but that they will acquire a different context. Context creates meaning, insight, purpose, depth, and fullness. And to say that ecosystems have limits must also be qualified. As long as an ecosystem is intact and vital, it can be an inexhaustible source of sustenance, pleasure, and beauty. A wonderful model of what I am describing here was recently proposed by Wendell Berry. Art, Mr. Berry reminds us, does not enlarge itself by limitless expression, but rather is enriched within boundaries. A painting, however large, is bounded by a frame or a wall. A musical composer or a playwright must reckon with an audience's capacity to sit still and to pay attention. Within such limits, the artist achieves elaborations of pattern and the sustaining relations of the parts to each other and to the whole, and such bounded contexts do not limit meaning or resonance for the viewer or listener. Ecosystems survive by the same inexhaustible, ever-changing intricacies, the same bounded potentialities. Ecoliteracy, eco-literacy then replaces a delusional context 
the notion that humans live above and beyond the boundaries of the natural physical realm without need for restraint, responsibility, respect, or reverence with a context that sees us embedded in that natural realm and that realm embedded in us, in our bones, our lungs, our guts, our hearts. It replaces an orientation that engenders alienation with one that fosters affiliation. We need environmental science in our schools more than ever. A generation of students who are ecologically illiterate will be ill-prepared to meet their future. They won't understand what is happening around them or how to heal the damage that we've done. They won't be able to create new technologies that mimic nature's models for recycling waste and energy. They'll walk into the future without a map they can read. Every politician I know wants a computer in every classroom. Fine. Now, how about a garden for every school? How about soil as well as cyber? Your life is enhanced by cyber, but it's dependent on soil. I am confident that we can become eco-literate and quickly. Just look at how we have become computer literate. If I told you just two short decades ago that I like to Google blogs, you would have wondered if I had regressed and lost my adult vocabulary. So strange and unfamiliar would that term Google blog be back then. Come again, you might say. Well, you know, I like to surf the web on my laptop. <laughs> you do what on your what? I might follow with examples of favorite sites like Wikipedia, YouTube, eBay, and Yahoo. At this point, you would be humoring me with a nervous smile while you scanned the horizon for an escape route in case my incoherent demeanor was the sign of some underlying psychosis. If I ran on about how I like to collect tunes on my iPod and I like to Twitter, or if I asked to take a photo of you with my cell phone to download to a Blackberry, you would be really confused. And Im imagine your account of that conversation later. Well, <laughs> first he went on about playing with his lap at some sort of wicked hootenanny, uh, hooray or something like that. And he said he kept music in a pea pod and he liked to shiver uh, when he wanted to take a picture of me with some telephone in his skin so he could rub it on a strawberry. Well, <laughs> that's when I got out of there. Logically enough, words that are invented to name new things and activities follow what they describe. But words can also shape new behaviors, pull them from mind into being. Words like baptize, market, or democracy help create what they describe. Words can merely light up what we are passing by or they can illuminate the path ahead. Language is both a filter and a lens. It shapes perceptions and actions fundamentally because the articulation of reality is more primal than any strategy. A vocabulary implies a story about how the world works and why. A society that incessantly talks about productivity but rarely about resilience will be productive, not resilient. We chatter endlessly about opinion poll and stock market percentages, but the chances that you will hear or read the phrase carrying capacity in popular discourse is next to nil. Hopefully, ecological fluency leads us away from reduction, fragmentation, and an obsession with prediction and control. The self-organizing, emergent, ever-morphing, complex, dynamic, interconnected, non-linear world that ecological fluency describes is not a world of things, but a realm of relationship where process reigns, a dance. If we can so rapidly acquire new skills and understandings that we have gained by adopting computers in the World Wide Web into our worldview and into our daily lives, why can't we also become ecologically literate and just as conscious of those other worldwide webs that enfold us? We could also acknowledge nature's operating systems in our shared language. 
Hopefully, not too many years from now, if I use terms like ecotone, threshold, keystone species, biodiversity, nutrient cycle, and carrying capacities, others around me will instantly and easily understand me, even if I am riding on a bus with strangers. This is more likely to happen if we consciously use such terms and teach the concepts that they describe. So, those of us who are already literate, ecologically literate, and know that vocabulary, have a responsibility to use it, share it, explain it, teach it, and spread it, especially among others who are not yet ecologically aware. Help everyone on the bus to understand those terms that you already know. And maybe, just maybe, we could save this world one word at a time. I'm going to end here by thanking you once more. Uh, please keep integrating your concern for both the vitality of the natural realm and the human realm that is embedded within it. Keep weaving. Keep trying to give us better measures for what we are trying to create together, for what we call the economy, than gross domestic product, which has actually been pretty gross lately. And please, don't shy away from engaging politically. To take what you learn and to share it openly, applying and testing it in that messy, complicated, contradictory world that will sometimes receive it with a rough and tenuous grasp. Practice that awkward dance of mutuality that is the very signature of a democratic culture. Practice that dance where we share, we learn, we listen, reconcile, invite, reciprocate, step towards one, one another and embrace. If we take our dancing lessons to heart, we may become not only sustainable, resilient, but grateful, humble, and reverent. Wisdom or grace, or business as usual. The choice is here, now. Thank you. <laughs>